All right, here we are back again for one more installment of this midweek lecture. We talked about NMR. So how in the world did they use NMR to determine protein structures? We talked about an example where they used it to find fluorine nuclei, and they used it to find out where those fluorine nuclei were located in three dimensions. And so you remember from organic, one of the reasons why organic is so important for this class is that it can locate where nuclei are in three dimensions. It finds that out by connectivities. Now you're used to one-dimensional NMR, which does this for small molecules, and it, it does the co connectivities, but remember there's some through space couplings that you see with NMR. And so you can see which protons are near which other protons. Now, the thing is, the kind of NMR we talked about in organic does not really work well for proteins. If you take a protein, sure, it's got lots of protons on it, but you take that protein and throw it into a NMR, you see a mess like this. You can tell some general things about it, but you can't tell where any of those protons actually is. You can't solve this like you did an organic chemistry NMR problem. It's just too much of a forest. So how do you simplify this mess? Well, here's one clue about it. The NMR of how NMR responds depends on the series of magnetic pulses that you do and how you measure how the nuclei, like they get energetically turned and then they relax back. And different nuclei will respond differently. The couplings that you see are sensitive to the series of pulses that you do. And so what you do is you can do a more complex molecule, like for example, you can do an amino acid and if you do it with 1D NMR, you get something like this. Now this makes sense to you based on where the protons are. I believe these are the methyls. Correct me if I'm wrong. It's been a while since I took organic. But I can see that these methyls, uh, these uh, protons on the methyls are um, showing up right here in 1D. This is with a particular pulse pattern. And that shows up actually as the x-axis of this graph. If you take the same molecule and you do a different pulse pattern, you get a slightly different series of peaks. And so you get the one that's shown on the y-axis on this graph down here. This is a different pulse pattern that you do if you do a different, um, a different kind of proton NMR. And the really amazing thing is these peaks are actually um, correlated with these three peaks are correlated with these two peaks right here. And so the way that that works is that you actually do an XY graph of the two kinds of pulses, the two dimensions of NMR that you do. And on the diagonal, they pretty much line up. You know, all the peaks fall on the diagonal. In a sense, you have the diagonals where you see all the peaks that are there. But where you have a correlation between the peaks, it will fall off of the diagonal. And it means that the protons in this doublet are actually a certain distance from the protons in this quadruplet, or whatever you call it. And so you can tell that th not only that these things are splitting each other, but you can tell that A is related to B by a through space coupling. If this works for alanine by itself, it works for alanine in a protein. And if it works for alanine on one part of the chain, if those protons are close to, pro to protons on another part of the chain, they will actually show the same off-diagonal peaks that are couplings. Now again, there's lots of math that we are going through. It's graduate school math that you have to do to understand what's going on here, to actually do the science. I'm not going to ask you to understand the math. I just want you to know about the phenomenon and how this works. So when you have a two-dimensional NMR, and you can do multi-dimensional NMR if you want, Here's a two-dimensional NMR example, and it's showing that you have a coupling between two protons. At point one, you see a coupling between the two protons that the dotted lines are going to. At point two, you see another coupling between two other protons. You locate where those protons are, and you see in this graph right here, the one with box one was showing a through space coupling of these two protons. On the primary sequence, those are actually three residues apart, and yet they're very close. They're close enough to form the couplings. You take that as evidence that they are constrained to be close to each other. Because you know those are close in three-dimensional space, but they don't have to be from the primary structure, you, you figure that that is evidence that they're three apart and they're close together. Maybe it's an alpha helix.
by itself that doesn't pose much evidence, but if you get like 15 to 20 of those in a row and you see them over and over again, that's really strong evidence that yes, this primary sequence forms a secondary structure of an alpha helix because you have protons that are close together three or four residues apart. It can also work for protons in other things that are not even connected in a chain. The uh, peak for number two, the coupling for number two, was actually these methyl protons all interacting with this proton on heme. So I believe that was a myoglobin structure that you saw right there. You've got a constraint for this methyl is close to that proton on heme, and that really helps you once you get, those are like little ropes tying the protons together. So these are all examples of using protons which naturally react with NMR. If you remember your NMR, you remember that carbon-13 also naturally interacts with NMR. You can en enrich the carbon-13 in a sample by growing the bacteria in carbon-13 broth. Or you can put more N15 in, you can put more nuclear isotopes in. That gets pretty expensive. You know, carbon-13 broth is not the cheapest thing in the world but it will work for making a small sample of NMR that you can then look at the carbon-13 couplings and things like that. So N15 and C13 are, often, uh, are also often used, although most places use protons in some way. You can also turn down the proton signal, by the way, by growing it in heavy water, because if deuteriums replace many of the protons, those don't give an NMR signal. It's all a question of actually getting the signal down for NMR rather than getting it up. When you have these repeated constraints, you find out what is next to what other atom. And you put those protons together and you calculate the structure that satisfies all the constraints. Usually you have thousands of constraints and so you have a pretty good idea of what the structure is because there's only um, a, a handful of structures that will actually satisfy those constraints. What I like about this figure is it shows that there are cons some constraints that are very distant in protein um, sequence. And this shows you that this sort of folds into this hairpin right here. Then over here on the right side, you have repeated constraints that are every three residues or something like that. Actually, it's every two residues because those end up being close. This repeating pattern of every, every residue being interacting like this, it's actually, yeah, I, this is just a schematic, so I'm not going to try to figure it out too much. It's a repeating pattern, just like the repeating pattern of closeness that happens when you have an alpha helix. And so a pattern like this means alpha helix, a pattern like that means hairpin, and you get enough patterns together, you figure out where everything is. So you can actually um, figure out other distance constraints. Here's an example of um, distance constraints that were figured out by doing multidimensional NMR. Really what they do is after all the, the math, they say right here, residue L73, right here in the middle in blue, we found out that this proton was close to all these other protons because it's in a beta sheet. And that makes sense with all the other data we collected. But they got this specific through space coupling, this very useful XYZ information that shows that this proton is next to this, 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 and that proton, when the only way for that to happen is if it forms a beta sheet once you put it all together. So a lot of computations. And the other thing about NMR is what you'll get out of it is you'll f sometimes find that some of your constraints are loose, that you have many structures that will fulfill the constraints because your constraints are not as well defined on one end of the molecule. If you see that, you know something about it, you're seeing all those different conformations, but you can't fit them to a single model. Therefore, you've found a place where the protein is moving. It's like if you have the camera open for a long um, time and you move your hand, you see it sort of blurring out uh, w with the camera if you leave it open. It's kind of like that. It's just that the end of the heme, not the buried end, but the exposed end of the heme, is waving around and you literally are seeing it waving around. You're seeing the motion because you see the protons in the different places. So that's one thing that NMR can do that crystallography can't. It looks at protons and it sees multiple locations of the protons. 
This means that NMR is good for watching moving proteins, and a lot of proteins move a lot. For example, um, and you can see, even, you can even see how the moving can sometimes sharpen the signal in NMR. Here's a case of a protein called alpha synuclein, and if it's just all folded up normally, it's not moving very much. It ends up with a broad band in NMR the way they were looking at it. But they found out if they have the disordered version of this protein, that's moving more, and the way the NMR math works out, that ends up giving you an, an intense sharp peak. So by using NMR, you can monitor how much it's moving, because NMR can see how much it's moving. And that's the important thing about NMR. It's important for studying protein disorder. Not all proteins are, you know, always have good posture and are sitting still. Proteins are like little children sometimes in that they move around a lot. And NMR can actually see them moving. So strengths and weaknesses of NMR. It can see protein motion. The protein is in solution, so it's close to the ordinary environment. And um, there's lots of weaknesses too. Sometimes you have to grow isotopically labeled protein, which is expensive. And this is the big thing about NMR. There doesn't appear to be a way around this for most normal scientists and normal labs. You can only measure medium-sized proteins. Above about 50 kilodaltons, NMR begins to not work anymore for technical reasons that are very hard to get around. So most NMR can only be done on medium to small proteins. The big NMR magnets are very expensive. They consume a lot of helium, which makes them more expensive now because we are having some helium shortages. And the protein's at very high concentration. So you can say it's in solution, but it's still not quite physiological environment. This last one, I don't really mean it. I say it as an X-ray crystallographer, but as an X-ray crystallographer, I've always had sort of a rivalry with NMR, and honestly, their acronyms seem kind of silly. They have uh, nosy, cozy, toxy are the names of their acronyms for their two-dimensional pulse sequences. They even have one called sexy. So it's like, I don't know, extra crystallographers are a lot more dignified. So um, that's all I, we can say about that. So NMR has its uses. And there's another one that's the third one that I used to not talk about very much, but now I talk about a lot. And that's cryo-EM. That will finish up our Torah protein structure to talk about that third technique.